Welcome back to Curious Combinations and Everything's an Original Podcast. I'm AF Tanith, and today I am covering Dark, Season 3, Episodes 3 and 4. We open on our earliest scene yet. It's sometime in the early or mid-1800s, and the father of Old Tanhouse, the blind man introduced in the season premiere, is still alive. As he rides with his son in a horse-drawn carriage, decked out in his Sycamundus regalia and reading from the Ariadne playbook, this mysterious father-son duo have a discussion about life and death, immortality, and time. Cut to Old Tanhouse in his elderly years, having inherited the Ariadne playbook and the Charlotte pocket watch from his father. In this surprisingly upsetting scene, because it seems Old Tanhouse wasn't such a shifty dude after all, the mysterious man with a cleft palate enters Tanhouse's carriage to menace him, quoting the very same Freud quote that came from Clausen last season, before garroting Tanhouse to death. I still don't feel entirely confident in my understanding of what No Name is doing here, but I assume that all of his actions so far have been undertaken not in pursuit of reducing interference in the timeline the way a TVA or Temps Commission agent might, as I posited in the previous episode. Instead, it seems that he's taking people out in order to preserve the stable time loop, but why these people need to be killed outright instead of, say, transferred to jobs that would take them out of Vinden, or set up with people who might influence them to leave town, I couldn't tell you. It's possible that there's a piece of the puzzle that I'm still missing. Regardless, we find ourselves once again with Jonas and Eve standing in front of the Adam and Eve painting and the tangled up family tree. Old Lady Marta claims that he and she are Adam and Eve and that he's there to save their worlds. She's lying, of course. This woman is absolutely no different from Adam and she's manipulating Jonas every bit as much as Adam was. She doesn't intend to save both worlds. She's only telling Jonas what she thinks he needs to hear in order to get him to do what she wants. At the 2019 Vinden B police station, Ulrich has some teary-eyed theories about Matt's disappearance. He doesn't think that the corpse wearing Matt's clothes and bearing Matt's ID is actually his missing brother. That's impossible. His theory instead is much more grounded in reality as we understand it, that this is another little boy who was recently killed, for some reason dressed up to look like Mads, and dumped in the Doppler family bunker. Charlotte pulls Ulrich aside when it becomes clear that the case has emotionally ravaged him so severely, and in a private and fairly peaceful moment, Ulrich and Charlotte break things off. It goes far better than his attempt to break up with Hannah, that's for sure. Back in the 1880s, in Vinden A, Bartas, fresh from the reveal about Adam's true identity, confronts Jonas. Jonas, when presented with the reality that his friends know who he really is, chooses to walk away rather than defend himself. But Bartas is not content to let him go, and we get a repeat of the Jonas-Bartas fight from season one. Back to Kronmarta and Jonas. She's trying to convince Jonas that she and he are irrevocably bound, that they're tied together for all eternity, and that though Adam wants to sever this bond, it cannot be broken. She tells Jonas that he has to go back and set Marta B on the path to becoming Crone Marta for him to have any chance of saving Marta A, and he is a naive little doofus, so of course his dumb ass believes her. Speaking of Marta B, she's back at her house when someone begins ringing the doorbell rather insistently. It's Ulrich, and he's got some questions about the circumstances surrounding the discovery of Mad's body. He's convinced that Magnus and Marta are either lying or that their perception was altered by drugs, and we find out later that he goes so far as to get Killian kicked out of his housing under suspicion of Killian having been the one to give Ulrich's kids the drugs that they didn't actually take. It is not a good look for Ulrich, that's for sure, and this is what I was talking about way back in Season 1, when I mentioned my dissatisfaction with making the poorest on-screen family into drug dealers. There is a significant conflation, especially in America, of poverty and drugs and general so-called bad influence, and that is finally rearing its ugly head here. Marta is dating this poor boy, and now that she's acting in a way that Ulrich doesn't like, of course he doesn't blame his middle-class daughter. He assumes the poor kid is trying to drag her down to his level, and so he just casually tries to ruin the poor kid's life. No wonder Eric's parents thought the cops weren't actually trying very hard to find him way back when. I guarantee that they weren't. At the police station, Hannah arrives bearing food. She's looking for Ulrich, but instead she finds Voller and Charlotte. In an exact replica of the move Katerina pulled on Hannah herself in Vinden A, Hannah pulls Charlotte into a hug to check her scent, which gives her the confirmation she needs to decide that Charlotte and Ulrich must definitely be having an affair. Never mind that she doesn't actually have any proof. Never mind that Charlotte and Ulrich are already done. Never mind that Ulrich is the one who made a vow of fidelity to her. Charlotte just became Hannah's arch nemesis, and that is never a position you want to be in. Back at Marta B's house, she's talking to her brother, trying to find out if he saw anything else strange the night the body appeared, like apparitions soaked in black fluid, for instance. He says no, and she admits that she's starting to doubt the accuracy of her memories of what happened with the body. Maybe their eyes were just playing tricks on them, and in reality, I would say that she's right. 
Unfortunately, though, she doesn't live in reality. She lives in a nonsense world of time travel and alternate universes, so she is definitely barking up the wrong tree. In the 1880s, time-traveling Marta and Jonas have a confrontation. Adult Jonas asks her why he has no memory of ever visiting Vinden B, and I've got to admit, I am really interested in the answer, too. Given the thing that's happening here of Vinden A and Vinden B coming together through Jonas and the overlapping Martas, I assume that we're not dealing with a hypothetical Vinden C, but I really can't come up with another reasonable explanation for adult Jonas to lack a memory that both his past self and his future self have. But Marta says she doesn't have any answers, though unfortunately she's just as much of a liar as her future self, and her answers cannot be trusted here. I have no idea if literally anything she says to adult Jonas or any of the others is true. She could be lying to any or all of them at any or all points. She is clearly just as good at it as Hannah, as evidenced by the next scene in which Marta expertly convinces adult Jonas that she's giving him her only way out of 1888. It is the last bit of the radioactive fluid that powers the time travel devices, and she hands it over as if it is this big, touching sacrifice. Even I bought her sincerity here, yet it's a complete con. Marta's whole reason for being here is to set things up how Adam wants them, and then she zaps herself home after revealing to the audience that she had not one, but two more spheres of the time travel fuel. And back in Vinden B, in Crone Marta's mysterious library, we find out that No Name is working for her, and that he knows she lied to Jonas. Given that it's later revealed, to my understanding at least, that this is actually his mother? I'm very curious about this whole thing. How did she end up working with him like this, and why has she chosen to use all three faces of him as enforcers? It's not like the elderly and child versions of him really do much in their assassination and intimidation scenes. They mostly just stand around looking creepy. I guess what I'm saying is that I think Crone Marta is just kind of a drama queen and doing things this way for the aesthetic, because I can't come up with a better explanation than that. At the bunker in Vinden B, Charlotte B goes to poke around for clues. She doesn't seem terribly broken up by the end of her affair with Ulrich, which is honestly a relief to me. I don't really get how Ulrich is drawing in this many women anyway. Is he really such a catch that even in a small town like this, he's already got a new mistress lined up as soon as he marries the last one? It's ridiculous. Get some self-respect, girls. Anyway, the only thing Charlotte finds in the bunker is one of those pennies on a red string that were so common in season one, and we still don't really know what they're about, do we? Given that we only have a few episodes left, I'm starting to doubt that we're going to get any real answers on that front. I fear this is the kind of thing that I'm just not supposed to be curious about anymore. I fear that the show thinks I'm fine with never getting an answer on these kinds of minor dangling threads. Spoiler alert, I am not. But Charlotte recognizes this little token as the one Helgi often carries around, and speak of the devil, he's got it in his hand right when we cut to him. More importantly, he has now apparently decided that the time is right for him to march his ass down to the police station and confess to the murder of Mads. Again, I'm not entirely sure how this works. What I gather is that the whole Noah trying to build a time travel prototype device thing is still happening here. And you'll recall from my previous coverage that I'm not entirely clear on why Noah was building that device in the first place, since it doesn't really seem to have anything to do with the schematics that actually succeed in eventually making time travel possible. I guess all those little boys really only died for Noah to go on a wild goose chase that just so happened to put Jonas in the right place at the right time to blast him forward into 2052. And it seems that Helga still worked with him to kidnap and murder the children in this universe, which leaves me with questions, the first and foremost of which I mentioned in my previous episode, and will reiterate in a minute. At Killian's family trailer, a tense confrontation between Marta and her boyfriend leads to the truth coming out about what Ulrich did to him, and it ends in a warranted breakup. All my sympathy in this scene goes to Killian, and I am deeply curious about his larger role in the narrative here. If he is just a temporary boyfriend meant to make Jonas a little bit jealous for like an episode and a half, that is a wasted character right there. Then again, I kind of feel like old Hanhouse is in the exact same category. He showed up mostly to be a red herring for one episode and then get killed by Mr. No Name, and again, that is a waste of my time. We are too late in the game here to be introducing characters that don't contribute directly to the climax, and it's possible missteps like this that are making me a bit worried about how this show is going to wrap itself up. But who knows? Maybe old Tannhouse and Killian will turn out to be important to the end game after all. In any case, we're on to a redux of the Hannah blackmailing Alexander scene. Maybe it's because she knows she's going after the wrong person here, or maybe it's just that she has less hate in her heart in a world wherein she actually stole Ulrich. Either way, she's not quite the vicious bitch that we saw last season, though I will admit her previous request to destroy Ulrich was at least slightly less unhinged than her current request for Alexander to ruin Charlotte's life.
And Charlotte's life is already kind of in shambles anyway. After breaking up with her secret boyfriend, Charlotte goes to find her husband at his church. But it looks like Peter might have found a secret lover of his own. Benny, Voller's sister, is pre-transition in the 2019 timeline, or perhaps I've misunderstood her gender? I believe we are meant to understand that Benny is a closeted trans woman in this scene, but it's possible that Benny is actually intended to be gender fluid or non-binary or something along those lines. Either way, Charlotte appears to grasp the tension. Peter definitely reacts as if he's been caught doing something he oughtn't, but Charlotte is not the type for that kind of outright confrontation, so she ignores it. Instead, she interrogates her husband about Helgi and the old man's potential involvement in the disappearance of Mads, the murder of the boy who no one yet realizes is Mads, and or the disappearance of Eric. Peter, of course, insists that his father couldn't possibly have anything to do with any of that, and then gets an awful phone call. Helgi is at the police station, and he has just confessed. By the time Charlotte and Peter get there to deal with the situation, though, they're only just ahead of Ulrich. They're trying to figure out what's dementia-related confusion and what's truth when Ulrich storms in to assault Helgi, and Helgi is apparently shocked to see Ulrich alive. It was him, he says again, and what I'm piecing together from all of this is that for some reason, Ulrich did indeed end up going back to 1953 in this universe to try to kill baby Helgi, but that his attempt in Vinin B led to not the destruction of Helgi's ear and the lifelong incarceration of Ulrich, but instead to the destruction of Helgi's eye and the death of Ulrich. I wonder if we're ever going to get clarification on that, or if we're just supposed to assume that Ulrich becomes obsessed with Helga because of this scene and that because of it he follows Helga to the tunnels, just as he did in Vinden A. Either way, it was him is a lot more damning in the Vinden B context than in the Vinden A context. If we're talking about who killed Mads and the main suspect says that Ulrich did it, Ulrich just became suspect number two, didn't he? Elsewhere in Vinden, Jonas confronts a frightened Marta in the woods. He tries to convince her that all of the insane nonsense he's spouting isn't insane after all. And if I were Marta, I'd be running as fast as possible away from him. The boy is clearly unwell, and we as the audience know that he's going to grow into an increasingly unhinged man. Speaking of whom, back in 1888, I've gotta say, the Victorian mad scientist thing is really working for adult Jonas. I feel like if I could just divorce what's happening here from the context of the Sigmundus group, this little team-up is something I could really get behind. Jonas, Bartas, Magnus, and Francisca as accidental time travelers trapped in the Victorian era and trying to find their way back could honestly be its own show, and I think it's a show I could have really enjoyed. Alas, it's not to be, and nor is their present attempt at creating the wormhole. It appears for a moment as if they're going to do it, but something fails at the last minute, and the fluid collapses back into its bowl with creepy little inky tentacle tendrils flailing around. I will point out here that we have seen this imagery before in a dream. Jonas's dream, if I recall correctly. He dreamed about having sex with Marta, and about black feelers just like these trying to escape her abdomen. I said at the time that I feared it was something to do with a literal pregnancy rather than a metaphorical one, and it appears that I was both right and wrong on that front. It did represent a metaphorical pregnancy, the creation of the Sigmundus wormhole, but it also foreshadowed a literal conception, that of the nameless triple man whose origins we learn, and kind of see, in the next episode. But for now, Marta is fleeing. She used the failed attempt at creating a wormhole as the distraction she needed to escape 1888. It's here that we see she had plenty more time travel fluid than she let on, and Jonas and the others arrive at her room too late to stop her from disappearing. Back in Vinden B, though, Marta B is about to travel for the first time. Jonas leads her into the caves and takes her to the tunnels. The doors are different here. There is no Sigmundus inscription. Instead, it reads Eret Lux, or Let There Be Light. But our episode is not quite over. Marta uses her time and world-hopping device to travel to 2053, after the apocalypse in Vinden A. Unless that's just what the show wants me to think. And now comes the reveal of time-traveling Marta's motives. Adam sent her there to trick his past self. And now we have one last bit before we move on to the next episode. Marta B and Jonas emerge from the caves in Vinden B's version of the post-apocalypse. The world is just as dead here as it was in Vinden A, but while Vinden A is dark and cold, possibly the result of a nuclear winter, Vinden B is a blazing desert, possibly the result of global warming taken to an extreme. It's a very obvious dark versus light juxtaposition, but I don't entirely get it beyond the aesthetics. More importantly, though, is that I don't understand how this is possible. I talked myself in circles during my initial reaction to this scene and only managed to convince myself that it made sense and that I was just misunderstanding, but... No, I was right, this doesn't make any sense. The tunnels in Vinden A were created in 1986 and go 33 years into the past to 1953, and 33 years into the future to 2019. The tunnels in Vinden B, though, we know you can access them in 2019, but that one of them goes to 2052. 
My assumption here is that the show means for me to understand that the creation of the wormhole in 1986 Venin B, linked 1986 to 2019 and 2052, rather than 1953 and 2019, but why? Why would that be different? It feels like it's just for the convenience of showing me that the apocalyptic future is light and hot instead of cold and dark in this universe, and I've gotta admit, that is not a good enough reason to make this change. It breaks what I thought I understood about the wormhole. I thought that it was a kind of spreading out effect, that the creation of the wormhole linked 1986 with the 33-year cycle both before and after it. But either I'm wrong and the wormhole could have linked any two random times, or we're getting ready to find out that the wormhole wasn't created in 1986 Vin and B at all. Are we getting ready to find out that the wormhole was created in 2019 Vin and B, thus linking it with the 33-year cycle both before and after it? Or am I driving myself crazy caring about details that the writers simply didn't? I'm in this headspace, have been in this headspace all along, in which I think everything is building up to a greater whole within the story, that all of the details here are meaningful, and that it's possible to piece them all together into an enormous but coherent jigsaw puzzle. But a lot of the details being introduced in Season 3 don't seem to be inviting that kind of close attention, and the examination of these details is starting to make my head spin. Should I or should I not be examining these details at this point? Because if it's the latter, I don't think I can get on board with that. The entire appeal of this show to me is in the construction, in seeing how the individual bricks making up this narrative come together to form a beautiful, well-constructed, completely stable wall. If I am to find out this late in the game that the show intends to introduce new details that contradict the old and or don't really mean anything at all, I'm gonna be kind of pissed. I guess we'll see what happens in these last four episodes. I remain optimistic as I've really loved the show so far, but I am really starting to get worried here. But on to episode four. We open on Tronti walking through the woods, and he pauses to linger over the open mouth of the familiar Vinden cave. We are attracted to the dark like moths to the light, says the mysterious nameless man, and he claims to know Tronti. In fact, he claims to know his mother, in the capacity, one assumes, of having been Tronti's father. And I've gotta say, the idea of this guy having sex with Agnes is fully horrifying to me. I feel like this must have been a non-consensual tryst, right? Even if I didn't think Agnes was exclusively sapphic, I'd have a hard time buying that she would have ever been with this guy. This isn't like the Noah-Elizabeth relationship, where I find it hard to believe, but I am content with the assumption that he was a nice enough guy to her to prompt mutual feelings. No name here seems like he couldn't be romantic or even sexual with a person if his life depended on it, so I'm really only picturing two ways for Trondi to hypothetically be conceived. Either Agnes was pressured into taking one for the team so that No Name gets to kick off the dynasty that leads to his creation, or he just tracks down the woman he needs to rape to make sure that he's born in a few generations and he rapes her. Either way, it's a horrifying possibility, but I don't really see this happening any other way. Tronti too is spooked by this dude. After No Name gives him an Ouroboros bracelet, Tronti runs off. And am I wrong in thinking that this bracelet looks like the little handle thing we've been seeing in the caves since Jonas first explored down there? But then we're on to another sex scene. To my unending horror, it's Hannah and Egon, and bitch, I told you to keep your hands off of him. He's a cop, and he's a misogynist, and now he's apparently a philanderer, but that still doesn't mean he deserves to get pulled into the wake of a person like Hannah. And their little affair here is so painfully awkward. Hannah is an incredibly damaged person, and Egon is just a mess, and I am upset about all of this. I am also upset about what's up next. Claudia and Yana and Inez are hanging out in the woods, looking at softcore photos of nude women and talking about penises. Yana is clearly jealous when she hears that Claudia has seen Tronti's, and Inez seems to know that both girls are into him. It seems like she's needling Yana on purpose, though I don't think that Claudia yet realizes Yana likes him. Honestly, I had no idea that Yana liked him, or even knew Tronti yet at this point either. I'm very curious how the hell Tronti's life worked out the way it did. How did he end up married to Yana with children, while still carrying on with Claudia and fathering Regina? What an ass. Anyway, Doris shows up unexpectedly at the police station in the next scene, and I've gotta admit that this surprises me too. I had thought that Doris would have been long gone by now, but no, apparently she's still hanging around. Perhaps it's just that she's so fixated on trying to solve Agnes's disappearance that it hasn't even occurred to her to attempt the difficult task of a 1954 divorce. Whatever she's thinking, we find her obviously desperate to help find her former lover, pointing out the potential connections between Agnes and Noah, whose real name we find out here was Hanno. But after an especially misogynistic, vicious comment from Egon, Doris storms out of the police station and does not stop when her husband regretfully tries to call her back. Honestly, I just need these two to break up. 
I don't judge Doris at all for her affair with Agnes, and I'm only slightly more judgmental of Egon for his own affair, but it's definitely the same thing as I was saying way back in my initial few episodes of coverage when I was talking about Peter and Charlotte's relationship. Once a marriage is at this point, I get it if you think the only way out is to cheat, and I have a certain amount of sympathy, but seriously, would somebody please just grow the spine necessary to break up already? Back in the Vin and A post-apocalypse, Adam is sending Agnes to give Claudia the unidentified old woman's body newspaper clipping that we earlier saw Claudia give Agnes. And Agnes reveals that she knows who the origin is. She asks if Adam is going to tell Marta, and he refuses to answer. Speaking of Marta, time-traveling Marta bolts awake once again, and I am begging TV writers to stop having characters wake up from dreams that way, because that is not at all how the body's sleep cycle works. She finds that Magnus has been watching her sleep, and he's apparently been haunted all his adult life by what happened with her. I think that's kind of ridiculous, honestly, given that she's not actually his sister, but okay, sure. Magnus is rather dim, after all. At adult Marta's own version of the conspiracy wall, Marta B struggles to wrap her head around what her older self is telling her. Adult Marta tells Marta B that the world is going to end in two days, which I assume means two days from the day they left 2019. That also doesn't make a terrible amount of sense to me, but Marta's reaction definitely does. She outright tells Jonas and adult Marta that they aren't even real. Clearly, she's just hallucinating, and yeah, that's the track I'd take if I were her. Back in 1954, Vin and A, though, Hannah finds herself in a very different kind of trouble. She is pregnant with Egon's baby, and the look on her face makes it very clear that this is not something she wants. Cut to Egon. Helga's mom walks robotically into his office to ask for an update on the case, and then clarifies that she doesn't mean her son's case, she means Noah's. She is clearly obsessed with the dude for little to no reason that I can see, and she gets mortally offended when Egon suggests that Noah might have had a connection to a woman other than her. She tells him in no uncertain terms to find Noah, and then we cut to Doris. She is also trying to find Noah, though she wants to find him for a very different reason. Unfortunately, she's just walked into mortal danger because it's not Noah or any proper priest that she finds at the church. It's No Name, who calls her out on her interest in Agnes and hints at her husband's affair in such a way that she seems to pretty instantly believe him. Why? I don't know. It could just be that the situation was so overwhelming for her that it made an incredible impression. Or perhaps he confirmed what she'd been expecting all along. Or perhaps it's just that she thinks he's a priest and that a priest couldn't possibly be wrong. Either way, Doris manages not to get garroted here, and though I'm not sure she was ever in any danger of that, I'm pleased that it doesn't happen. I am less pleased with what happened next, though. We cut to Yana walking in the woods, and she comes upon Tronti sitting lakeside, contemplating the Ouroboros bracelet. He compliments her smile, and they walk home together. He tells her about the man he met who he thinks might be his father, and then he shows her his scars from being at the orphanage. Then, trying to emotionally move on from his loose connections to either his mother or his father, he gives Yana the Ouroboros bracelet, right before Claudia shows up to interject herself. At the police station, Egon is pissed that Hannah had the nerve to show up at his job, and then he is horrified by the reveal of her pregnancy. I really don't know what he was expecting. I thought you were being careful, he tells her, and I have no idea what the hell he means by that. The contraceptive pill was not introduced into Germany until midway through 1961, fully seven years after the conception of this baby, so what the fuck did he think she was doing? If she was using a diaphragm, I think he would have fucking noticed. Surely you can feel that thing in there, even if you didn't see her insert it? And I hope he's not suggesting that she should have been using an old-fashioned method like washing her vagina out with Lysol. And you can look that one up if you think I'm joking, because that shit is literally Lysol and will fucking injure you if you put it on your mucous membranes. Oh, and yeah, it doesn't actually work. Just put a fucking condom on if you don't want your mistress to conceive, you stupid jackass. Surely you can at least manage that much. But no, Egon decides to double down on being a stupid jackass. He asks Hannah if the baby is even his, and oh boy does Hannah fucking lose it. He is practically cowering as he faces her anger here, and I wish I could be as satisfied by it as I would like to be. If only it were any woman besides Hannah who was standing up to his misogyny like this. Alas, it is Hannah, and Hannah is nuts. After a brief scene between Claudia and Burnt, we find an unfamiliar man getting into a cab driven by our trio of nameless assassins. But they're not here to assassinate him. All they want is for him to sign the papers to approve the construction of the nuclear power plant. And with a gun pressed right against his side, the man, of course, gives in. Back in the future, adult Marta tells Marta B and Jonas that they have to keep the barrels beneath the power plant from being opened in two days' time. But Jonas isn't terribly interested in that. He just wants to know how to save his Marta, not how to prevent Finn and B's apocalypse. 
and adult Marta reveals to Jonas that he's been duped once again. There is no way to save Marta A, but he can save Vinden B, provided that he leaves Vinden A to its fate. According to her, he has to choose one world or another, and I guess that's as valid a theory as any. Personally, I think either both worlds are going to be erased, or else that they're going to be melded together somehow to create a kind of fusion world, but I suppose there could be a satisfying narrative built around Jonas actually going through with choosing either A or B. If I were going to guess which one he would choose, I'd wager it would be A. Back in that world, though, we find Agnes in 2054. She's giving a sad goodbye to the girl with the scar from last season, and I have to wonder what I'm supposed to be assuming about their relationship here. If they were lovers, I would expect a kiss. Am I supposed to think that they're close friends? Mother and daughter? Sisters? I really have no idea. I honestly wasn't even expecting to see this girl again. How, I ask you, did she wind up working with Adam? Back to Egon and Hannah. Because Egon is an imbecile, he clearly both wants her to abort and doesn't want her to abort. To his credit, though, he refers her to someone who he thinks will be able to safely perform the procedure, and he gives her the money that she'll need to pay for it, too. It is really the least a man in his situation can do, given that abortion is very much illegal in 1954 Germany, and is only decriminalized in Germany even now in 2022. Back in Vinden B's future, Jonas and Marta B return to the desert cave, and no sooner are they gone than Noah, presumably Noah B, walks in to reveal via conversation with adult Marta just who the origin is. It is no name. He is Marta B and Jonas' son, and he is also Tranti's father, which means that he is his own great, great, great grandfather? Honestly, given what's happening in Charlotte and Elizabeth's family tree, that is barely even a blip on Vinden's incest radar. At Egon's house in 54, Doris has finally mustered up the courage to do what she needs to do. She asks Egon for a divorce, catapulting him straight into the final stretch of the worst day of his life. His mistress turned up pregnant and scared the shit out of him, and now his wife has both caught him and is holding him accountable. That this leads him to drink is really all we need to know about Egon as a person. It was his choices that led him here. I don't have much sympathy for where he's at emotionally when this episode ends. Like, you made your bad dude. Lie in it. Hannah, though. I don't know what Hannah's thinking. She heads to the abortionist and talks to baby Helena. Katarina's mother is kind of desperate to have a friendly connection with Hannah here, and Helena both loves Hannah's fake name, meaning that Hannah essentially stole Katarina's name only to give it to her, and the St. Christopher medallion that Egon gave Hannah prior to finding out about the pregnancy. While little baby Helena goes back to get her abortion, and this poor girl truly cannot be a day over 14 here, Hannah apparently changes her mind about her own termination and decides to leave the medallion for Helena to keep. Interesting that Helena seems to still be wearing it 33 years later. Back in 2053, time-traveling Marta reveals that she is working with Adam as a part of a deal. She did what he wanted, and now he's got to tell her about the origin so that she can destroy it. Adam tells her that it's taken him 66 years to figure out how everything fit together, and she deserves to know, too. Cut back to Marta B and Jonas. They have made it back to Marta's bedroom in 2019, and she admits that she feels the connection between the two of them. She felt it as soon as she set eyes on him, which I find to be a bunch of overly romantic nonsense, but I guess some people enjoy that shit. Anyway, they're both crying as their romantic moment starts, and I know I should be horrified over the incest and the conception of the Infinity Baby, but I'm mostly just horrified by how dirty they both are in this scene. Like, go have a shower or something first. Y'all two are visibly disgusting at the moment. Can't you wait until you find some soap? But no, there is no holding back this Romeo and Juliet, John and Daenerys cross-universe teen lust. Jonas and Marta B go at it, which, frankly, I personally think is a betrayal of Marta A's memory, but sure. And then we cut back to time-traveling Marta. She is not meant to stop the origin, he tells her. She is going to create it. In fact, she already has. She is already pregnant with her nameless son, conceived presumably by the sex scene we just witnessed, and I dread to discover why she has never given the little bastard a name. Hatred? Neglect? She thinks he's some kind of a soulless monster? Seriously, just name your kid. Because if you don't, then I will. So, like I said, I am beginning to have a certain amount of doubt that this story is going to be going in a direction that I like. Certain decisions are being made so far that I am worried by. Um, little details here and there. Little things that, I don't know, it seems like the show wants me to have forgotten little questions that I am increasingly certain are not going to be answered, or at least increasingly frightened are not going to be answered. And I'm here for answers. I am desperately, truly here for answers. As I said, the entire appeal of this show for me is that it is a jigsaw puzzle. I am very interested 
ultimately in finding out how all of the pieces fit together, and if you tell me that once the jigsaw puzzle is complete, there will be pieces left over on the side that simply were not a part of the puzzle in the first place, I'm going to feel a little robbed. I hope I will not have to go so far as to call it bad writing, because so far, the show has been pretty good in the writing department with a few small quibbles here and there, but, you know, the more that the show seems to introduce and then neglect, the more likely it is that perhaps we are going to start seeing some less than stellar writing. I truly hope not, but it's definitely a possibility. So, in any case, we have just four episodes of this show left, which means that I have just two episodes of my coverage of this show left. And so I will be back next week, of course, with my coverage of episodes five and six. In the meantime, if you are interested in seeing my reaction videos to this series or any of the other series that I have covered so far, including Umbrella Academy, Squid Game, Bly Manor, Midnight Mass, and on and on, then you want to go to my Patreon, where you can get those for $5 a month. Alternately, any patron that subscribes for one or more dollars per month gets access to all of my polls determining what it is that I watch from week to week. So if you are interested in deciding what it is that I will be watching in the future for this podcast, that's what you want to do. Otherwise, if you are not interested in any of that, it would be appreciated if you could leave a rating or a review on your podcatcher of choice, or to talk about the show on social media, or just to recommend it to a friend. With all of that said, thank you so much for listening. I am really enjoying this, and I hope, I desperately hope, that I will also enjoy the end of this show. Peter definitely reacts. Reacts? Cool.